Good morning. My name is Jim Jones, and I'm the Executive Chairman Emeritus of the Atlantic Council Board of Directors, and I'm honored to be here to welcome everyone to the latest edition of the Council's front page. Today, we are very fortunate in being able to feature the Minister of Defense of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Kaisa Olongren. As is well, well known, the Netherlands has long been one of the staunchest allies of the United States. Both are seafaring nations, and as a Marine and in my previous capacities, including at NATO uh, and National Security Advisor to President Obama, I've, I've uh, seen firsthand uh, from the field and from the White House the significance of this close and unique relationship. So on behalf of the Council and the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security's Transatlantic Security Initiative, it's my great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Minister Olongren. The minister is visiting Washington, D.C. for meetings with her American counterparts, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and members of the U.S. Congress, among others, at a time when storm clouds have unfortunately returned to Europe. Russia's brutal and unjustified and illegal invasion of Ukraine has appended the European security order and is sending shockwaves globally from disruptions to energy markets to rising food insecurity. In Europe, NATO allies and partners have responded with great unity to Russia's illegal and unprovoked aggression. NATO allies have deployed ships, planes, and troops to strengthen the defense of NATO's territory and population and continue to provide much needed equipment and intelligence necessary for Ukraine's defense against Russian aggression. Last month, NATO summit in Madrid set out new and ambitious targets for the alliance, whose accomplishments will reinforce defense and deterrence on the Atl alliance's eastern flank. This enhancement of NATO's forward posture is welcome and builds on the steps of the alliance and individual allies have taken to enhance transatlantic security. The Netherlands has been no exception to this and has in fact been a leader across several areas. The Netherlands was one of the first European countries to pledge significant military aid before Russia launched its invasion of the country on the 24th of February, including advanced radars, underwater vehicles, arms, munitions, and protective equipment. After the invasion commenced, the Netherlands provided additional, in, in, including, additional aid, including Stinger missiles and anti-tank weapons. At the same time, the Dutch government recognized the need to invest further in its own defense, announcing a 5 billion euro in, addition, in additional defense spending for 2022, with a plan for long-term investment out to 2025. These have been articulated by the publication last month by the Minister of Defense of New Defense White Paper, which we will address and discuss in today's discussion. I'm hopeful that these investments will enable the Netherlands to both deepen and widen its defense collaboration with our country. The Minister has served as Defense Minister since January of this year, bringing a wealth of government experience to her current post. She previously served as Minister of the Interior and Kingdom Relations, Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam, and in positions at the Ministry of General Affairs and the Ministry of Economic Affairs. To moderate today's discussion, we're delighted to welcome Aaron Mehta, Editor-in-Chief of Breaking Defense. And with such, such a challenging road ahead of the transatlantic community, we all look forward to hearing the Minister's remarks. Before we begin, just a short housekeeping note. For those of us in the studio today, simply raise your hand if you'd like to contribute a question, and one of our team members will pass an iPad for you to submit your question. For those joining us virtually, there are two ways to participate. Please use the hashtag pound ACF front page to ask questions and engage with the discussion on Twitter or you can submit questions on Zoom using the Q&A function. With that said, Madam Minister, welcome again to the Atlantic Council, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, General. Thank you for your kind introduction and for inviting me here today. It's an honor to be here at the Atlantic Council uh, and to share some thoughts with you. I think that our countries share a thirst for liberty 
uh, and in our histories we will find many similarities. People all over the world risk their lives in a fight for freedom in their own countries. And if they don't succeed, they're willing to flee their homes to find freedom elsewhere. My family history is a testimony of exactly that. My grandfather was a young officer in the Tsarist army. He was born in Kiev, which was then, at that time, part of Russia. He descended from an old Swedish-Finnish family and became Russian through the annexation of Finland in the 19th century. He fled his country during the Russian Revolution and he ended up in the Dutch Indies. And my father came to the Netherlands after surviving the atrocities of the Japanese occupation after the Second World War, also in the hope for a better life. And being forced to free from violence and aggression and seeking freedom elsewhere, history does repeat itself. It strengthens my conviction that we have to do everything in our power to protect what we value together. Some would say that the bond between the United States and the Netherlands began with gunpowder. American revolutionaries fought with Dutch gunpowder purchased from us in 1774. Others would say it began in 1776, when the Netherlands was the first to acknowledge the sovereignty of the United States, with a first salute to the flag on the American vessel, the Andrew Berea, fired from cannons stationed at the Dutch island of Sint Eustatius in the Caribbean. Our country's military contribute to cooperate closely on regional security in the Caribbean until this very day. I took this short dive into our histories as a bridge to discuss our present, because we're all rooted in history of our families and of our countries, but also because this teaches us that individual liberty is a concept that unites the United States and the Netherlands. Each year, on the 5th of May, the Netherlands celebrates its liberation from the Nazi German occupation in 1945, a liberation that American forces were an essential part of. And liberty is one of the core values the Ukrainian people are fighting so hard for today. And it's a fight that frightens Putin. He fears liberty. He fears democracy. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall and since the end of the USSR, he has developed a ruthless obsession to travel back in time, as far back as the Russian Empire. While most Europeans look forward, drawing lessons from history for a more secure and more prosperous future, Putin looks back to the past. He's tsar-struck by Peter the Great. There have been warning signs, of course. Putin's Munich speech, his five-day war in Georgia, his swift annexation of the Crimea. But despite these warning signs, Russia's imperialist war came as a surprise to many Europeans. And it shouldn't have. We should have thought the unthinkable. We were warned by the intelligence community of massive buildup of Russian troops. In particular, the US and UK intelligence services went public in extraordinary detail. While those efforts failed to deter Putin's invasion, it strengthened the transatlantic resolve and it allowed swift decisions on sanctions against Russia and support for Ukraine. For Europe, the invasion of Ukraine has been a watershed moment. Putin's aggression has brought us closer together and has reminded us Europeans that freedom and security cannot be taken for granted. That hard power is a prerequisite for European security. European countries are now upping their defense budgets. Finland and Sweden are joining NATO. Denmark has joined the EU defense cooperation. And the EU is providing billions of euros of military aid to Ukraine. In 1631, the French philosopher Descartes, who lived in the Netherlands for most of his life, he wrote the following about Amsterdam, and I quote, in what other, in what other country could you find such complete freedom or sleep with less, less anxiety and find armies that are ready to protect you." Unquote. His juxtaposition of freedom and armies to protect you is striking. After the end of the Cold War, many expected Russia to become a true partner, 
In only 2006, the Russian Navy ship Pitlivi flew the NATO flag as part of the NATO naval force in the Mediterranean. And now it's become necessary to rebalance soft and hard power. And that's going to take time. And nevertheless, I came here with an ambitious message. The Netherlands, a country that has liberty in every fiber of its being, is strengthening its defense. And not only that, we're working together with allies and partners to become stronger together. First, by helping Ukraine to win this war. Admiring their fierce resistance is not enough. We have to help them because Ukraine can prevail with our help. Russia must not win this war. And the stakes are high for the whole world. The cards are being reshuffled. And we're grateful to the United States for initiating the Ukraine Defense Contact Group in order to ramp up military support to Ukraine and make sure that support stays at the top of the political agenda. Second, by getting European defense in order. The NATO summit of two weeks ago was a historic demonstration of transatlantic unity. And today, a long list of countries lives up to the 2% of GDP commitment. The Netherlands will spend 2% of GDP on defense in 2024 as pledged in Wales. It's a 40% increase. Last month, I presented our defense white paper outlining how we will invest in our forces. Europe must get its act together. European countries need to do more. They need to do more together and they need to be able to act also without the United States and to hold our own if necessary. We talk a lot about European defense, but what does it really mean? It means, it, it doesn't really mean collective defense, let me state that first, because that's what NATO is all about and that's what NATO is for. Within NATO, European countries need to provide more capabilities and have more forces at high readiness. We Europeans, we need to know what to do more ourselves and that's what European defense does mean. Now is the time to work together on joint development and smart procurement to have not only more, but also better capabilities to improve interchangeability, to improve standardization. That will make us better partners in the Alliance. And the Netherlands stand ready to lead on international defense cooperation in order to tackle these challenges that we're facing together. And we're working hard to further bolster our position as your gateway to Europe. Taking the lead in military mobility in Europe, providing host nation support to US troops and brokering US-EU cooperation. And we, as Europe, need to do more on our own with regional partners. And yes, once again, if necessary, without the United States. With our European military capabilities and the legal and economic instruments of the EU, we have an ideal mix of tools already at our disposal. As a wealthy economic bloc, we should be able to take greater responsibility for security threats in and around the European theater and beyond. At the Shangri-La Dialogue last month, I reiterated the Dutch committed commitment to stability and security in the Indo-Pacific. We played an important role instigating the European um, Indo-Pacific strategy that led to a more coordinated and structural European naval presence in the Indo-Pacific. So by stepping up to the plate, by strengthening European defense and reinforcing cooperation between NATO and the EU, we will further strengthen NATO and the European defense. And we'll do that in our transatlantic security partnership, as the United States has been asking us to do for some time now. So both in terms of defense investment and in terms of deployment, the Netherlands will work with the United States with NATO, with the European Union, and with our European partners. And the US can count on the Netherlands as a trusted and capable defense partner. In closing, Europe has woken up to the idea that security is not a given, and that there is not just one threat, there are multiple. The war in Ukraine, China's assertiveness, a global hunger crisis, climate change, to name only a few. 
we will contribute to a united response in defending the international rule-based order together with our global partners. We have to show and tell that freedom will triumph in all corners of the world. We can do so concretely today by putting the spotlight on the fact that the looming food crisis is the fault of Putin alone. The announcement yesterday by the Secretary General of the United Nations on getting grain out of Ukraine is reason for some optimism. The ball is in our court now to demonstrate that our actions that through our actions that might does not make right and that we can help to solve this crisis, that it pays off to play by the rules. Only through our results, however, will we be able to lure in countries that are on or beyond the tipping point back into the democracy camp. And there is a lot at stake. We're facing a diverse, complex, and increasingly concerning strategic environment. It's up to us to make the right decisions so we can pass on liberty and peace to next generations. And to paraphrase Descartes, we have to do this by striving for complete freedom with armies at the ready to protect us and to that I would add, it needs to be a concerted effort. Today, I live in the city that has served so many as an inspiration for liberty, Amsterdam. I carry my family's past with me in my name and in my ambitions as Minister of Defense during these troubling times. Today, Kiev, my grandfather's birthplace, is a free city in a country under siege. Finland and Sweden will become NATO allies very soon. The Netherlands already ratified last week. And as a founding member of both the European Union and NATO, the Netherlands will continue to play its international role to pass on peace to next generations. It's up to us to leave the Boer world in a better shape for future generations. So thank you, General. Um, thank the audience. I think there is a lot more to discuss, and I look forward to your questions on these topics. And by that, I pass over. Well, uh, thank you, Minister, for those comments. I think that set the table pretty well for a discussion here. Um, and as mentioned at top, uh, we will be taking questions from the audience, so please do send those in as we go along. Uh, I have a nice little iPad here so I can catch them in real time. Uh, I want to start with something a little bit timely, which is obviously you're here in Washington, and uh, yesterday you met with Secretary Austin, I believe for over an hour, which uh, shows, I think, the interest and, and willingness that he has there to, to focus on these issues right now. Obviously, Ukraine is going to be the main topic. I understand that. Can you get into a little bit of the specifics about maybe areas of focus that you discussed with him or potential areas of collaboration going forward that were brought up? Yes, well, I, I, we had really, really good discussions on, on, on many topics, but of course, Ukraine and the war in Ukraine is, is top of mind. Uh, and it's also where our focal point is, you know, to, to step up this support that we're giving to Ukraine. Uh, I, I thanked him for his leadership because really, I mean, this, this group that we have now, this Ukraine Defense Coordination Group, is his initiative. Uh, and it's extremely important because when, when it all started, you know, every country was just trying to do whatever they could. Right. But there was no coordination. Uh, and as you know, our stocks became become emptier. Uh, we have to we have to concert our efforts, and we have to work in a coordinated way, not only between allies, but also with our industries, for instance. Uh, and we have to. We are now. I think we've woken up to the idea that it might take a long time, which mm -hmm. also shows that we have to coordinate our efforts. And of course, the United States is a very important partner. You see, the, the sheer number of aid that they're giving to uh, Ukraine uh, is really very impressive and very important. Uh, and I think what, what Secretary Austin is also doing is, you know, he's uh, looking into uh, how we can uh, we can help each other. Mm -hmm. So how we can also, as the Netherlands, can provide more, knowing that we have this partnership with the United States. So without being specific on the the weapons that we sure. did, we of course talked about the capabilities as well. Uh, and in the Netherlands, we don't we don't give out those details, so that's really confidential. Uh, but uh, we were able to take uh, to take a few extra steps there, so that was really good. When you say about extra steps, I and mean, understanding you can't get into the specifics, but are we talking about uh, industrial participation? You mentioned the stocks, which has obviously been an issue across the number of nations now. Uh, maybe working with American industry more closely or working with the Pentagon more closely to help supply things or coordinate 
what you're both sending to Ukraine to match and mix and match there? Is that what I think about? it's both the short term. So that is how can we get more in on the short term in Ukraine yeah. what they what they need. Uh, it's also about training. Uh, so uh, mm. you've seen, for instance, we have uh, done training for for Ukrainian military on the Panzerhaubitzers, which is uh, long uh, range artillery. Uh, and uh, as you say, it's also about you know if you get that in as soon as possible, how do we arrange ourselves in, in our in our uh, in the cooperation that we have that we can get you know a refill uh, mm. of, of things that we do provide because you need to look at the longer term as well. And while we're helping Ukraine, we're also building our you know the the posture of NATO on the eastern flank, uh, and that you need you need your military, you need your servicemen and women, but you also need your capabilities and weapons in there. Uh, and the simple thing, like you know, the stock of ammunition, mm -hmm. uh, we were pretty early in the Netherlands, I think, to to order extra. Uh, but you see what is happening. The, we are we're all standing in line uh, at the at the ammunition factories. Uh, so we do ha we need to do a coordinated effort there as well. Are there any specific stock areas? Ammunition may be the answer, but that you're looking at and you're being concerned in six months and a year, we're going to actually be running dry on these issues. I think that that's something you constantly have to to watch and you constantly have to to fix. So, but it's uh, some things like ammunition. You know, the stocks were already low, so mm -hmm. you need them get them on the right level. Also, to have our troops at the stage of readiness that we need. Uh, but we also, and I also discussed that with Secretary Austin, we're also doing new investment. We're looking in, for instance, we have ordered extra F-35s, and we're looking into uh, long-range missiles uh, mm. for them to equip them with, which is also a, a big step uh, for us, but we can do that now because we have the 2%, the so we have the budget to fill that uh, capability also in the NATO context. And I think that is very much welcomed by the United States. Mm. Uh, and I understand that, and I think it shows that in, within NATO, every country tries to do what it has to do uh, to make sure that as an alliance uh, we, we, we are ready and we can do the deter deterrence and the defense uh, necessary. Before we get into the budget increase, which is definitely something I want to bring up, um, one other timely thing, your prime minister was in Ukraine, uh, met obviously with a number of people there. Um, one of the statements he said was, quote, uh, looking at providing additional, quote, heavy weapons, armored vehicles, and self-propelled propelled howitzers. Uh, again, with the understanding that Netherlands doesn't go into specific capabilities or quantities, how do you balance, again, giving new weapons to Ukraine, sending more equipment to Ukraine, with Netherlands' own domestic needs for its own security? Well, the plan that I presented now, the new defense white paper, it's also a long-term plan. Huh? So mm -hmm. some things you start with immediately, filling up the ammunition stocks. Other things, you know, buying capabilities, it does take time. So we were happy to order extra F-35s and, uh, for instance, also MQ-9 Reaper drones. Right. Uh, because that is an, uh, a capability we already have. We're going to expand on it. We're going to make the third squadron of the F-35s. We're also investing really in new technologies. Uh, so these things take time. We're building our uh, armed forces to, to get on a higher stage of readiness. But it will look completely different 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. It's going to be future-oriented. We're, we're looking at a war that's really a conventional war. But there, there is so much more. There is also, we've had uh, issues with you know, cyber uh, attacks for a very long time now. We've seen hybrid warfare mm -hmm. uh, before the invasion. Uh, we know that space is going to be one of the next stages for us, for NATO, for NATO to, to, to really invest in. Uh, so the white paper is about a lot more than just you know, how are we going to deal with these Panzerhawitzers. I guess the question that the US is certainly wrestling with and has for, for several years now is the near-term chaos. In this case, we'll, we'll put that to Russia, but in the US case, obviously, it's been dealing with the Middle East, et cetera, while keeping an eye on the future. And you know, it's, it's easy in a lot of ways to say, well, we're going to be able to do both. But you know, the US can't do both effectively with this budget. Obviously, the Netherlands, while increasing its budget, it's a smaller pot of money. I think that's a safe thing to say. So. Do you see areas where maybe the Netherlands has to increase its risk or increase risk tolerances, perhaps, in order to be able to say, we deal with the crisis right now, we deal with the crisis of 10 years from now, and there's something in the middle that might just have to perhaps fall by the wayside, or a mission set that maybe just has to fall by the wayside? I'm not sure we could afford that kind of approach, mm. because I think you know, the, the Russian Federation, as long as Putin is there at least, uh, is, is a threat to, to Europe, to our region. But it, it, it's really not the only threat. I mean, we're looking in Africa, in the Sahel region, mm -hmm. uh, which is also influenced by, uh, 
by Russian sending uh, Wagner paramilitaries right. there. Uh, we have instability in the Middle East. We're looking at Asia uh, and China. Uh, so there is, there is so much more. So we cannot simply say, well, we focus on Europe for now and we'll just wait and see uh, what happens next. So we have to prepare, I think, for all of that. And I think that is why we have alliances. That is why we are in NATO. That's why we're stepping up also in Europe to make sure that if there were some kind of problem in the Western Balkan, for instance, uh, that we can also deal with that, knowing that the United States might also have to deal with other issues. So I think that's why it's so very important to have this coordinated effort to really think through all the threats that are facing us. And I think at the NATO summit in Madrid, uh, I think we did a pretty good job. Uh, and I think we've got all the threats, you know, they, they're in the strategic concept. And now it's up to all the member states to make sure that they, uh, they do what is necessary. So let's talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, very fairly quickly after uh, the invasion began, uh, the Dutch government announced a budget increase. And please tell me if I've got those numbers wrong, but I believe it's uh, 2022 increase was in, uh, the 2022 budget will now be 14.8 billion on defense, and it's 19.38 billion by 2024, which will cross that 2% mark uh, within the 10-year period that everyone had agreed to. Uh, again, obviously, this is a direct result of, of Ukraine. I'm wondering uh, not only if maybe you could just give a couple highlights for where the new money is going to be going specifically, but whether there was any situation where there's previously planned investments that were set for a world pre-Ukraine invasion that perhaps are going to be changed or you know, you put something down to increase elsewhere in this kind of new world order that we're dealing with? Well, when we started in January, the new government, we, I, we thought we were looking at an increase that we would bring us up to EU average on, mm -hmm. on NATO. Uh, and then after the 24th of February, uh, Parliament asked me uh, and the government to tell them what was necessary uh, to, to step up the defense uh, spending in view of this uh, new situation and the new security threat and new security threat assessment that we did in, in Europe. Uh, and that's when we uh, decided to increase even further and to reach uh, the 2%. Uh, and only after that, we, we, we sort of finalized the white paper. So we had already, of course, started thinking about what choices can you make. Uh, but it, I think it's important to say that uh, in, in, the, in the Netherlands, uh, like in many other European countries, we have been cutting uh, defense spending for a very long time. Uh, and so that means that when we're now increasing, we first have to, you know, to fix uh, what needs fixing. Right. Uh, and that is you know, increasing the salaries making sure that our servicemen and women are have you know, better better payment, better conditions for the work they do, that they get the right gear, that they get the right stuff, that they get enough training. Uh, so that's the basis. If you don't get that, you cannot, I mean, the rest of it's all, you need these men and women to right. do, We've seen do that the work. We've Russia, right, if you don't have the actual training. Exactly, in the yeah. And that's also having, you know, the readiness at a higher level. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's our really first priority. Uh, and then, of course, we're looking in, in what, what, what are we really good at? Uh, and, and I think, for, for instance, the F-35 that I mentioned, it's because our Air Force is really up there in the high end uh, with other countries uh, and in, in the fifth generation of, of fighter jets uh, and providing them also with the, with the fifth generation weapons. So that's a priority for us. Another priority is in, in the Army to further integrate our Army with the German Army, mm -hmm. which makes us stronger also within NATO and with the Euro European um, uh, Union. Uh, and so, well, you'll find it all there in the white paper, but these are just a couple of examples of how, how we're dealing with this. But I think what's important, while we're all increasing our budgets, I mean, we've seen Germany announcing also the increase, they're also reaching 2%. Um, uh, if we don't spend it in a smart way, if mm. we don't get our act together and, and really coordinate our efforts and try to align uh, procurement, uh, try to align the life cycles that we buy, jointly and by the same things that are interchangeable, even further than interoperable, uh, then it's only going to increase prices and we're not getting more security and more defense. So that's also one of the Dutch priorities mm -hmm. and try to, you know, to work with other countries like Germany, uh, uh, France and other countries in Europe that also have a defense industry uh, to have less fragmentation that we have seen for a long time also within NATO. So how does that happen, though? Because this is something that's been talked about for years, yeah. and the issue that it always comes back to is no country wants to give up its domestic defense industry and the production of the jobs that creates. And so inevitably, there's a buy local push. And what might make the most sense to have everyone buy one tank from one country just doesn't happen. So do you think, because of the current threat, maybe 
countries are going to be more willing to be open to this? Or is it just a matter of you just got to kind of keep pushing that rock? I think it, do, it does make sense to do it right now. When there is more budget. So, I mean, there was some kind of fear of losing, you know, jobs and, 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 and industry. And, and, it, it, that, and that's, I can understand that threat. But there is more budget now. There is a lot of demand. Mm. So this is really the time to move forward. Uh, and it's much better for our defense. So if you look from, from our security and defense perspective, it's the right thing to do. And if you look from the industry perspective, I think it's also the right thing to do. If you look at Dutch industry, for instance, defense industry, we're almost always part of a bigger uh, coordinated uh, coordinated efforts. So we, I mean, we we join forces with German industry, we join forces with French industry, British industry, and it's going to make us uh, stronger. And I think that is what the European Union is also about. It's an internal market. Mm. We know how to do these things, and we just have to do the same with the defense industry. How concerned are you about inflation right now, in terms of your ability to perhaps, you know, at the same time you've got this big budget increase, all of a sudden everything costs more? Yeah. But that's, of course, it's a big issue. Uh, in the Netherlands, we're at 9.4% now, mm. which is very high. We haven't seen that in a very, very long time. Uh, and prices are going up. I mean, uh, you saw it immediately with the, the, when we provided Ukraine with certain uh, weapons. Uh, those prices went up four or five mm. or even ten times. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, at this moment, that's a real problem. Uh, but I think we'll we'll have to see how it goes because you know it's also the result of of, of the whole uh, situation with energy prices on the rise. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, the European Central Bank that has to deal uh, with that, um, and it's especially a problem. I think right, you could say it's a problem for when you buy weapons, but it's especially a problem for just you know ordinary people uh, back home who cannot pay their energy bills anymore, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the the real issue for for our government. I want to talk. Uh, just kind of broadly more Ukraine, I suppose, uh, before we get into some questions from the audience. Um, you said in the opening, your speech, uh, Russia must not win this war. And I think that's a sentiment that you certainly will find around Washington and across European capitals. But one question that I haven't gotten a great answer to for the last several months is what Ukraine winning the war looks like, you know, or at least Russia losing the war looks like. Um, to your mind, what is a realistic end game scenario for Ukraine? Well, it's, it's a million dollar question. Um, it's very difficult to answer. Um, but I, I think it's very important that you know, Ukraine being a sovereign country, uh, the, the attack and the invasion being unprovoked and illegal, mm. uh, where you know, we should all be bound by the UN charter. Uh, and so that's why I keep repeating that this Russian aggression can never be rewarded, which means Russia cannot win the war, because that you're giving Putin exactly, uh, exactly that. We, so that cannot happen. What what the end state could be or should be, uh, I, I think it's not it's not up to us to decide. I think it's up to Ukraine. Uh, it's up to the president of Ukraine. It's up to the Ukrainian people. Uh, at some point, if they could could accept some some situation. Uh, which is not exactly uh, what it was before. I mean, for the Netherlands and many other countries, we never, uh, uh, we never acknowledged the annexation of Crimea. Right. Uh, same goes for, for the Donbass, where the war was already going on before the invasion. So it's, it's a very difficult question, but in the end, I think it's for Ukraine to answer. Fair enough. You mentioned uh, Sweden and Finland's NATO ongoing membership drive. The Netherlands said rat ratified the situation now, so that is moving forward. From your standpoint, from the, the Dutch standpoint, what does adding those two countries do to NATO, and how does it change uh, the calculus of, in your assessment, Russia's thinking when, when dealing with the alliance? Well, it's, I mean, uh, we know uh, there is uh, 1,300 kilometers of border mm -hmm. between Finland and Russia. So on the first side, you would say, is that really an improvement for security for NATO? But I think it is. Uh, first of all, the, it's the other way around, it's the same thing. So for mm. Russia, they get an extra uh, thousand plus kilometers of border with NATO. Uh, and secondly, if you look at the map, uh, especially the Baltic states, they're very uh, exposed. Uh, same goes for the, the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, with Sweden and Finland in, if you look from, uh, you get strategic depth in the, in the NATO uh, uh, allied uh, territory, which is really going to help uh, if at some point uh, you would have actually to defend uh, the Baltic states. 
Uh, and besides that, these are two countries that are not only you know, value-based uh, countries, but also uh, in a, they have defense organization that is really, really high level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that quality that they bring in, and we already, they were already partners to NATO, we already worked with them uh, also between our uh, militaries. Uh, so that is, they also add that uh, to, uh, to the alliance. I want to look abroad even further a little bit um, and just talk briefly about the Indo-Pacific. Uh, obviously, in the strategic concept that came out of NATO, China was highlighted in a way that it hadn't been before, although there had been NATO leaders who had talked about the issue of China in the past. Um, what's your perspective on balancing the strategic competition that's going on in Europe and the Indo-Pacific for the Netherlands, you know, as domestic priorities and, and personal priorities? And also in balancing that as a member of NATO and the EU. Yeah, I think we, we have to look at, you know, we are a seafaring nation. So we know how important it is that, you know, that the seas are free. Mm. Uh, uh, for, for Also for just for economic uh, development and traffic. Uh, and in that sense, the Indo-Pacific is extremely important. Uh, and I think I, I was there in, in Singapore. I talked to many, many countries. Uh, and they are facing, uh, also there are multiple threats. They're looking, of course, at uh, China and Taiwan and the South, Korea, uh, th South Chinese Sea. Uh, but if you talk to uh, South Korea, for instance, they're very concerned with North Korea and the missile testing uh, that they're, they're doing. Uh, so also there, there are different threats. I mean, if you talk to Japan, it's a completely different story than we've heard before. Mm. They're also developing uh, their, their military, uh, and they feel they have to. They don't want to, they feel they have to, because there is a real threat to them for the future. And I think it's very good that the United States, for instance, is reaching out much more uh, to several countries uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And also they're building you know, an alliance with, with countries uh, and to, to make sure that we have these uh, contacts, that we, we show also by being there, by being present there, that we care, that we feel that this is a part of global security. Uh, because the other way around, we also expect them to support us when we support Ukraine. Right. How does the Netherlands work to support, or how can the Netherlands work to support uh, the countries that are maybe more actively you know, doing operations or, or working in there, particularly US, UK, France, in Pacific operations in the Pacific theater? You know, is there a role for the Netherlands to maybe fill in a niche, as we discussed, going through Europe? Or is it more of a political support and you know, kind of doing occasional training type operations? Well, I, I think it's both. Uh, and of course, we don't have the size of the countries that you mentioned, but I've pledged to send uh, one of our warships every two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we already did that once with the UK uh, strike uh, carrier group. Uh, so we're going to repeat that every, every two years. Uh, and, and we're just looking into what are th other things we can do, and it's, it is about practice. But it's also about you know, having the, the right contacts. So, so making sure that you know the issues uh, and, and that you're there to support when, when needed. All right, well, we're gonna turn to the audience questions here. We have a couple in, but obviously please, uh, folks continue to send them in as we go. Um, gonna start, actually, I guess along the same lines here uh, from Ian Brzezinski. You mentioned the maritime dimension of the US-Netherlands security relationship. In light of Russia's aggression and the threat it poses to allied operations in the Atlantic, do you envision an increase in the US-Netherlands surface and subsurface collaboration in the Atlantic and Caribbean? And if so, what would that involve? Well, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, and what that would involve, I mean, that's what we have to, to start, start working on. Mm. Uh, as I'm here now, actually our commander of the Marine is also in Washington discussing exactly these issues. Was that a topic that maybe came up during your meeting with Secretary Austin yesterday? Oh, there were so many topics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Fair enough. Um, we have one from Jeff Felden. He asks, what are you seeing from Russia in the gray zone, and what measures is the Netherlands taking to counteract Russian influence in information operations? And if I may just add to that uh, a little bit, to your point about uh, kind of future investments and, and making sure that you're thinking about future conflicts, uh, what are maybe a couple of technology areas or you know, whether training on how to deal with information issues uh, that, that are a big focus going forward? Hmm. Well, if I, if I understand the question correctly, uh, the gray zone, uh, that's really about the hybrid uh, cyber attacks, espionage by Russia, uh, which we, we have seen, we've seen all of it in the mm -hmm. Netherlands. 
Uh, so one of the things that we do is making people much more aware of these risks. Uh, so at what one point we saw that they were uh, sort of uh, taking over routers uh, mm. in, in just you know small medium sized enterprises and using them for other purposes. Hmm. Uh, and people are simply not aware of that this could be happening to them uh, and that you have your, to have your cyber security really in order and on a, very, on a, on a higher level. Uh, so not make it too easy for them to do these things. Uh, we saw Russian espionage at the OPCW. Uh, so I I in the gray zone, I think we, we're, as a government and, and the intelligence community, uh, we're very aware of that this is happening. And of course, Russia is not the only country that we have to be uh, aware of, of these uh, things. We're also worried about uh, China and, and some other countries. Uh, but there is, I mean, as a government, you cannot be the only one to, to do this. So we have to work with the business community, with the universities and knowledge mm. institutions, uh, and to make sure that they get their act together. Is the relationship between the government and your industry and, and these other communities, do you believe that's an open, solid relationship where you're able to communicate about these issues? Or do you believe there's, you know, whether it's, I don't want to say mistrust, but just a, a lack of willingness to listen on these issues? Well, I think there is, there is a willingness to listen. But I, I think that uh, we have to make sure that it's much higher on their agendas. Mm. And I think there is, to a certain extent, um, also sometimes some naivety in, in, the, in, these, uh, in this field. Uh, that you, know, you hear about it, you read about it, you know about it. Mm. But sometimes things happen and, and then people just don't make the connection. Uh, so that's what we have to keep talking about. Uh, and keep telling them, hmm. and, and also, of course, helping. You know, how, what can you do? What measures can you take? From an information standpoint, you, know, you mentioned this in your speech, the US and the UK really an unprecedented level of declassification and putting things forward in the lead up to the war and since it began. Uh, is that something that you think more countries in NATO and the EU should be following the example of when talking even internally to its own people? I think it's, a, it's really a change. Huh? We, I mean, the intel communities are used to not exposing anything right. because you, know, you risk all kinds of, of things when you do. But I think we must learn from this because this yeah. has really worked. Uh, I think not only you know, to, to, um, to help us see what actually has happened, but I think in, at some point you can also use it to prevent certain things to happen. I think we've seen that too. Hmm. Of course, you can never prove it. Uh, but, but if you predict that something will happen, some kind of false flag uh, uh, operation, uh, well, then the one planning the false flag operation will have to stop it. Hmm. So in that way, it does work. Uh, of course, it needs, you know, it need, if you have an intel um, community like the United States and also the UK, which is really much bigger, of course, than we have in, in other countries, uh, then you can do these things. But we are also learning from this and also trying to think of ways in which we also could, could use this, uh, this type of approach. All right, we have one from Stephen Shapiro who asks, what new initiatives do you recommend to avoid a prolonged war of attrition? And could you imagine Western boots on the ground, at least to protect civilians? I assume the question is about Ukraine specifically. Yeah. Um, well, on the atrocities, I think it's important that we, we've said from the beginning, we want those responsible to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And today, uh, as we are here in The Hague, there is a conference uh, on uh, accountability. Uh, and it's really about under the International court, Criminal Court is, going, is coordinating our efforts of different countries, sending teams to Ukraine to make sure that we, we you know, collect uh, the evidence necessary for a court to eventually convict those responsible. So that's really important. So we know the atrocities are there, mm -hmm. but we have to collect the evidence and secure it and make sure uh, that, that we can do that. Uh, and second, on boots on the ground, that's a very difficult question. Because I, I think this is a, was an invasion of, uh, ordered by Putin, by Russia, of Ukraine. So there are two countries at war. And we're doing everything we can to support Ukraine. And it has united us as, as ever, never before within NATO, within the European Union. Uh, and at the same time, we know that Russia uh, has uh, nuclear capabilities. So do we. There's also always been a sort of understanding that that's the reason uh, not to risk uh, an attack on, on, or, or, or boots uh, on the ground. Uh, so that's our position. And um, I think for the, for the future, we'll, we'll have to see how this, how this develops. And I, but I think I keep saying that it is unacceptable. 
uh, and that for that reason we feel that Ukraine has a right to defend itself and that we will support them with almost everything uh, we can. That is what we keep, will keep, do, keep doing. The question mentioned a war of attrition, and it certainly seems like uh, that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, there was the initial push from Russia, which you know, I think by all accounts failed spectacularly. They've regrouped, and now they seem to be have decided they can just grind foot by foot uh, and take the territory that it's aiming for. I guess I'm wondering what your assessment is right now of where the, the conflict is, and do you think this is just the, what we're seeing right now in the East is going to be what it is for the duration, or do you think uh, something could change there in terms of the nature of this conflict? Also a different, difficult question. Um, I think what we're seeing now is a very slow progress by uh, the Russian uh, troops, but there is progress. Mm. Uh, we know, of course, that the, it's a bigger country. Uh, they have lots of weapons. They're also, I mean, they're using them really in terrible ways with uh, victims, civilian victims, uh, and just a disregard for, for human life in mm. general, I think. Uh, and um, and I mean it's not it's not a free and democratic country, so they can keep this up. Putin can keep this up for a very very long time. So I think it's really more about what the resilience in Ukraine, which is quite strong. Uh, and I I think in the end uh, we don't know. Huh? We don't know if Putin will, if his real goal is to to have the Donbas. Uh, or if his real goal is, goal is more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we, really, we really don't know. And I think it's very important we, what we're seeing today, and I hope, as I mentioned in my speech, that there will be a grain corridor from Odessa through the Black Sea, that we're going to get the grain out, uh, and that uh, that part of Ukraine can more or less function again as, as a country. Uh, and we are ready also to help to rebuild uh, the country, because besides all the losses of human lives, it's been a complete devastation of the infrastructure. Uh, so, um, uh, whatever, uh, uh, like I said, I mean, it's up to Ukraine at some point, perhaps, to accept a certain end state mm -hmm. or not. Um, but it's for sure that there is, is a lot of work has to be done to rebuild uh, whatever Ukraine is going to be in the future. Uh, one from Hans Benendijk. How do you assess the Dutch strategy of working closely with other neighbors, such as integration with Germany's army and other close cooperation with other partners, naval and air forces? Obviously, this is something that we talked about a little bit, but I'm, I'm just wondering, is this a strategy that, that is working and will continue to work going forward? I, I'm absolutely convinced of this strategy. It, it, it is working, and it has to work. Uh, I mean, we are we are now we're in this uh, European Union. We're also with Sweden and Finland joining so many European countries, also within NATO. Right. Uh, so it's it's the way forward. Uh, and I think we look at the United States. What makes the United States strong is also the scale of the country, uh, the scale of the budget, uh, the scale of the capabilities that it can produce. Uh, and we have to step up, step that up in Europe. And the way forward is, of course, to to work together and to cooperate more. Uh, we've been doing so for a long time already with Belgium when it's uh, about the Marine. Uh, we've been working for a long time with Germany with the Army, and we're going to take further steps, further integration, uh, and by that also making the alliance stronger. So uh, it is definitely the way forward. Uh, we have one from John Pett who asks, can you elaborate on how NATO intends to reinforce its enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states? Should we expand these forces and what should the Dutch role be? Yes, we, we will expand them. Uh, we, we have now this, you know, we had, should, I should say, this tripwire concept. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that if I was someone living in the Baltic States, I would feel very uncomfortable knowing that there is a tripwire. And we've seen uh, comments from the leaders of Estonia in particular yeah. the last couple of months that's yeah. been very upfront saying, yeah. this isn't going to work. Yeah, this is not going to work. Because then you, you accept that the Russians could come in and you have to push them back again. Right. Uh, and that feels uncomfortable for them, and that I understand. And I think uh, the... The, 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 the Sakur of, of NATO has put forward a strategy which I agree with completely, and the Germans have also done this for, for Lithuania especially, where we say, yes, we're going to increase not only troops, but also capabilities on the eastern flank, so also in the Baltic states. But we're not going to do it in the way we you know, thought in a military way in the Cold War. So we're going to do it in the modern way that fits uh, what we have to be able to do as a NATO, as NATO uh, now, which means that you put troops forward, but you also have troops at a high readiness uh, in their home countries. So that means that Germany 
uh, the Netherlands and a few other countries that are in Lithuania will increase in Lithuania itself, but also will increase readiness at home. So if uh, necessary, we had a very, very short uh, notice, can send extra troops there. And that's the concept that NATO has agreed to now, and that also the Baltic countries are, are comfortable with, uh, because they know that it's going to give them more protection. Mm. Do you see uh, Netherlands' role growing over the coming years in that regard? Well, yes, because I, I think when after the 24th of February, we, we immediately stepped up our efforts. Mm. Uh, we sent uh, F-16s to, to Poland. Uh, we are now we're having our patriots in Slovakia together with Germany. Mm -hmm. We're preparing for deployment in Romania. Uh, we had uh, F-35s in Bulgaria, so we, we responded quickly. Uh, but at the same time, we said, okay, this is what we can do now, but we need a strategy that's going to, to take us over the next period of time for a longer period of time. Uh, and that strategy is, I mean, the strategic concept is the basis for that. Then we're going to have regional plans. So we plan to, you know, to increase in Lithuania, Germany's lead nation, uh, and, and we stand ready to do more. Uh, but we, you know, we have to know what the NATO plans are exactly so we can really uh, focus uh, our efforts, uh, and it's a bit fragmented right now, hmm. but of course that was necessary because we had to increase the posture on the short term. A question from the audience, which I think is actually maybe in some ways the most important question of the whole Ukraine discussion, which is how concerned are you about, you know, for lack of a better term, Ukraine fatigue? That hmm. the populations in all these countries will grow tired of the conflict, will start to tune it out, and eventually, uh, certainly as the U.S. saw in Afghanistan and Iraq, different situations, but you know, eventually say, why are we doing this? Yeah. It's just, it is what it is, and we need to get our guys back and, and, and worry about our own personal countries. So how concerned are you about that, and what can you do to counteract that? Yeah, well, I think that is a real concern. I think it should be our concern also, because we, and that is, for instance, when, when our prime minister went to Kiev uh, the other day, Monday, that was his message. Uh, the, his message was, look at wh what I'm seeing here now, look at this devastation. Uh, this is uh, the, the cost, this is the price that we are paying uh, for our freedom. So yes, Ukraine is fighting the war, mm. uh, but this is something that we, that this are, is sort of our moral duty uh, to help Ukraine. And it means it comes at a price. Uh, and you know, we have sanctions in place because we want to make the cost high for Russia. Uh, but inevitably, these sanctions are also going to be felt in our countries. Uh, and in the Netherlands, you mentioned the inflation, the mm -hmm. energy prices are going up. Uh, and of course, that is the, the first concern of people. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing people in the Netherlands taking care of Ukrainian refugees, women and children coming to the Netherlands seeking uh, a safe place. Uh, so I, I think, and, and we, if, as long as we keep repeating that message, Mm. Uh, that, that, that it comes at a price. And as long as we can help uh, the, let's see, the people who actually need help, who cannot cope on their own, who cannot pay their energy bills anymore, uh, I think that, I mean, that's what governments are for. Hmm. Uh, and that's what we'll just simply have to keep doing. Uh, another one that we have here, let's see. Uh, this is an interesting one from Benjamin Cross. What do you foresee of the future of nuclear non-proliferation efforts given Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons? Effectively, how can the non-Russian nations work with Russia on nuclear non-proliferation when, as you mentioned, that's kind of the big trump card that he has to play? Yeah, yeah. But uh, isn't that always the issue? I mean, mm. now we're in a, in a uh, more situation uh, where there has some, has been also some nuclear rhetorics from, uh, from Russia. Uh, rhetorics from R Russia, and I think um, at the same time, uh, we are also, I mean, NATO also has nuclear capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been the balancing act uh, for, for a number of, of years or decades even. Uh, so while we acknowledge that we need that because uh, Russia and also other countries mm. have, have that capability, at the same time, you should never put non-proliferation off the agenda. Uh, because yes, at this moment, there is no table where you can discuss these issues. Uh, but we must always work towards a situation where we can discuss these issues because it's a real threat to mankind. Uh, so if, even if it's not possible now, on the longer term, non-proliferation 
uh, and eventually, I mean, uh, preferably you, you wouldn't have any nuclear weapons. Uh, but instead, I, I saw the press conference of President Biden just now. Uh, he's very worried, I think, about uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. Iran, and I, I think, th well, that, that's, that's the real situation that we're in right now. One question here from the audience. Uh, how will the Netherlands help implement NATO's innovation fund? Sorry, which innovation? The NATO Innovation Fund. Ah, uh, the NATO Innovation Fund. That was Very announced good. at the uh, yes, the the summit in Madrid a couple weeks ago. Uh, I believe twenty five countries perhaps signed up for something like that. Yes, I don't think the U.S. signed up. The U.S. did not sign up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I, 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 it's really good that it's there, uh, and it's it's really uh, I think it's a, it's sort of a new approach also from NATO because NATO was was always about you know big money being spent on big capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but this innovation fund is also used for small and medium-sized enterprises, for startups, for really high-tech uh, uh, new initiatives. Uh, so well, I'm looking forward to using it. And we have several uh, initiatives also in the Netherlands, for instance, in the region of Eindhoven, uh, that can make use of it. And I think it works like the European Union also has these kind of initiatives where countries have to work together to um, to apply uh, to funding, uh, and that works very well. So I think it's a great initiative. All right, we have about five minutes left. Let's see if we can get through these last two ones that we have here. Uh, the first one is from Michael Novikov, who says, how does the Netherlands plan to contribute to increasing demand for underwater technologies and robotics for defense? Well, it's a very good question. I wish I had the answer to that, <laughs> but I probably wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> Certainly fair. Um, and then we're going to, we'll have this be the last one uh, from Brigadier General Fritz Erbach, who's the military attache for the delegation to the EU to the US. Uh, and he asks about your mention of Africa uh, from earlier and critical security humanitarian situation in Africa, especially the Sahel. Do you think it's realistically possible to balance efforts to step up the presence of readiness in Eastern Europe while doing more militarily in Africa? And I guess that comes back to the question that I asked earlier of, are there simply things that can't get done because there's too many priorities? Well, first of all, I mean, there is no country that has to do everything on, it own, on its own, not even the United States, which is definitely the biggest one. Uh, so that's why I said it has to be a concerted effort. But I think we can simply not afford not uh, to contribute also in Africa. I think it's extremely important. Also for the Netherlands, I mean, we have NATO, uh, we have the UN, we have the EU. Uh, we have different theaters where we have to be active. Uh, and of course, we cannot do everything at the same time, but luckily, uh, we are allies, uh, so we can also share that burden. Uh, and I think for, uh, for the Sahel, it's really important to remember that this is, this is a region with, with so many problems, with so many poor people without any prospects. And that's the reason for the terrorism growing mm -hmm. in the Sahel. And that is a threat to European countries. Uh, and if we simply wait and see, then at some point we will really regret that. So I think it's extremely important that the United Nations is present there with this uh, MINUSMA mission and that we as European countries, but also in coordination with the United States, have a strategy for the Sahel for a longer period of time. So that we not simply, you know, by sending a couple of thousand Wagner paramilitaries, the Russians are taking over there. We cannot accept that. Well, I think that maybe is a good place to start because it ends. I think it, it underlines the fact that everything is connected right now and that you know, large countries like the U.S., perhaps slightly smaller countries like the Netherlands, everyone's kind of figuring out how to hit balance everything right now. Um, I think that's maybe a good way to, to sum up this discussion today. Uh, I'd ask everyone to join me with a round of applause for the minister for her great thoughts today. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much.